So welcome to this presentation about homeopathy and uh, the past, present, and future of homeopathy. I wanted to uh, do this presentation, even though it doesn't have information specifically on remedies or homeopathic philosophy, because I really thought it was worth looking at an overview of homeopathy's history uh, to have an understanding of what the future of homeopathy may be and how you might fit into it. So we're going to start with the past and then move on to the present and then we're going to have some really neat um, interviews with practitioners that I'm going to share with you uh, about the future of homeopathy. Homeopathy got its start uh, more than 200 years ago with uh, its incredible success with epidemics. So the founder of homeopathy, Samuel Hahnemann, was very successful in treating epidemics of many kinds, uh, including scarlet fever. One epidemic that uh, isn't mentioned here is uh, that he discovered, for example, that the homeopathic remedy belladonna is often very effective in scarlet fever. And that's when he started giving people remedies prophylactically, meaning almost like a vaccine. So if somebody, uh, if there was a family that had scarlet fever or that it was going around, he would give everybody a remedy uh, to prevent it from spreading. And it was extremely effective. And that's how he kind of developed this idea of what's called homeoprophylaxis, which is prevention of disease through homeopathy. So it's got a similarity to vaccination. Of course, it's not exactly the same as vaccination, but it's similar in taking something in advance um, before the disease. So one of these uh, first uh, epidemics besides the scarlet fever was typhus fever, which had been spread by lice. And this was during the Napoleonic Wars back in 1813. And Hahnemann, was able to treat 180 cases of typhus and only two people um, died. So that's like about a 1% death rate, uh, maybe just a little bit more hair over that. But at that time, con the conventional treatments, more than 30% of the patients who were having uh, conventional treatments at that time were dying of typhus. Um, another kind of epidemic that was treated by Hahnemann and his fellow homeopaths um, was cholera, another very deadly uh, disease. And um, the, you can see here that the, the people who underwent homeopathic treatment, the death rate was only 9% whereas the allopaths were having people die in the, in the area of 40 to 80%. So it was a, you know, a terrible epidemic and people did much better when they were being treated um, with the homeopathic remedy that was indicated for that epidemic. And as I was saying earlier, each epidemic, uh, there may be a remedy or there may be a number of remedies that are indicated and different epidemics of the same disease may need a different remedy. Um, we, uh, Hahnemann called the remedy that was needed in a particular epi epidemic, a genus epidemicus. So he would take a whole number of cases, a whole bunch of cases and find what is the remedy in common that all these cases need and, and identify one or two or three remedies. And so each epidemic that I'm describing here, even if it's the same disease, uh, may have needed different remedies. Another cholera epidemic, this was a very important one, uh, traced to a public water pump. Um, 10,000 people died, and the mortality rate with the allopaths was 59%. And with homeopaths, it was only 9%. Uh, the person who dug up a lot of these uh, these statistics is uh, the late Julian Winston, who was a homeopathic historian and went through records and found out about uh, these fantastic records that homeopathy had with epidemics, which explained why homeopathy was so popular at this time, um, because people were getting better from very, very bad diseases. Another uh, epidemic, this one uh, was actually in Brazil. 
Again, phenomenal statistics with homeopathy having only a 2% mortality rate, the allopaths 40 to 60%, and uh, homeopathy is very popular in Brazil and is part of their national health care initiatives because it has been shown to be so effective. Uh, the same thing is true in Cuba. Homeopathy is also very popular in Cuba, and we're going to talk quite a bit about homeopathy in India, where it's huge. It's like a form of mainstream medicine. And, uh, you know, it may not be an accident that some of these countries that are more tropical countries where they have more of these kind of deadly um, diseases that homeopathy has been so popular because it works so well. Yellow fever epidemic. Uh, this was back in 1878, a yellow fever epidemic. Again, the homeopathic loss was 6% as opposed to 15.5% for the allopaths. Uh, so, um, and these were, let's see, uh, a million prescriptions given to 500,000 patients uh, and about a thousand doctors of allopaths and homeopaths. So it's worth noting that at this point, there were homeopathic medical schools in the United States, there were homeopathic hospitals, and, um, and so there were many, many homeopathic doctors. It wasn't a rarity the way it is now. Uh, and uh, although, you know, if you go to a place like India, there are uh, m many thousands of homeopathic doctors. But in the U.S. at this time, homeopathy has become rare, but it wasn't at that time, back in the um, 1880s when we're talking about this yellow fever epidemic. Diphtheria epidemic, again, phenomenal results around the same time. This is in Broome County, New York. 83.6% um, mortality rate for the allopaths and a 16.4% mortality rate of the homeopaths. Um, it's difficult to treat um, because it had rarely the same presentation, so you had to really choose an individual remedy. Um, for this. Now, you may think, now these diseases, why is this relevant? Cholera, diphtheria, typhoid, we now have antibiotics. But the thing is, um, we also have resistance to antibiotics, and we have bacteria that are becoming resistant. So revisiting homeopathy for these kinds of diseases is probably a really good idea um, in the long run, and at least uh, using it as a first system of defense. And here's an example of a disease that doesn't respond to antibiotics. This was the great Spanish flu epidemic of 1918, um, where it was just wiped out all kinds of um, areas of the world. It was a terrible epidemic. And this is just um, documenting the flu. Um, this is just a doctor in Dayton, Ohio, who. Um, documented 24,000 cases of flu that were treated allopathically had a mortality rate of 28.2%, while 26,000 cases of flu treated homeopathically had a mortality rate of 1.505%. So the survival rate for homeopaths was tremendously higher. The uh, genus epidemicus, or the main remedy for the Spanish flu epidemic, was actually gelsemium which uh, is a remedy that we still use today very frequently for flu. Uh, but it could, you know, there have been times even in the last few years where there has been um, some concern about different kinds of epidemic flus coming through, the bird flu or the swine flu, um, or these different kinds of viruses or, you know, the Ebola or different kinds of viral diseases uh, coming uh, and rapidly killing people. Um, this keeping homeopathy in mind about how effective it is with epidemics, including with viral epidemics, which do not respond to antibiotics. This becomes a very, very important, um, could become very important in the future. So homeopathy was so appreciated and loved uh, back at that time. Um, we're talking, you know, about a hundred, a little bit over a hundred years ago, that um, 
the American Institute of Homeopathy erected a memorial to Samuel Hahnemann uh, in Washington, D.C. The memorial is still there. It's very beautiful, and you can visit it if you ever go to Washington, D.C. Uh, but just to give you an idea how well established homeopathy was at that time um, with the medical schools and the hospitals and the clinics and the thousands of doctors, etc. So now we're going to move on to some things that are happening now. Uh, this one I just added recently because uh, there was, it's, on, uh, it's on the news. I, I go to my news.google.com and it's telling me that Prince Charles um, is using homeopathy for um, his cattle and sheep on his organic farm and how effective he finds it. He's a great proponent of homeopathy, as is the whole um, British royal family. They all uh, use homeopathy as uh, their main form of medicine, and uh, they have a homeopath that they consult with regularly. So homeopathy is very well established in the UK as well, and with the royal family, using it even for their animals. This, as I said, is kind of headline news right now. There's also been some good news um, in the last several years about uh, the freedom to practice homeopathy by unlicensed um, practitioners. So back when I started practicing, which was over 20 years ago, um, around 1990, so I guess we're talking about 26 years ago or so, um, there weren't rules really, there weren't laws for or against in California. There, it was a very much a gray area as it still is in many states where um, there are, there's a group of practitioners that have medical licenses and then there are people uh, such as Ayurvedic practitioners, herbalists, homeopaths who um, do a kind of natural healing but don't have licenses and it's always been a gray area as to what the le like legality has been. So in response to that, to protect both the, um, the natural healers as well as the consumers who, who love this kind of thing and want to have access to alternative health care, um, 10 states have now adopted what are called these safe harbor uh, laws, health freedom laws which uh, protect the practice of homeopathy and other natural forms of healing. And so nor, I'll tell you exactly what the California bill is like, and I think most of the bills are like this. Basically what they do is they say it's okay to practice a natural form of healing as long as you disclose to your clients that your education, the modality that you're using, um, and things like the number of years you've been in practice and just kind of describe your practice to them. And then the most important things are you do not claim to be a medical doctor and you do not stick needles into people or mutilate them in any way. And you do not claim to, uh, uh, to cure cancer. So you don't go out there saying, I'm a doctor and I can cure cancer and let me stick something into you. So as long as you're not doing any of those three things, um, and you do disclose. Uh, the, in California, we're supposed to have people sign something and hold on to it uh, for a number of years, I think three years, uh, just to document that we did give them that information and we are not claiming to be doctors. So those are pretty easy kinds of uh, regulations to follow because claiming to be a doctor and sticking needles into people or claiming that you're going to cure somebody's cancer are not good ideas. Anyway, we, we tend to present ourselves more as um, consultants or counselors um, who are providing information about homeopathy and helping people, uh, educating people to support their vital force so that they are able to uh, embark on a path of self-healing because that is much more in line with the principles of homeopathy. Um, it's really about enlivening the vital force to uh, evoke a healing response. And so we want to empower our clients and we want to keep the decisions in their hands and we want to you know, take the best case we can and find the best remedy we can for them and also uh, let them know that they're responsible for their own healing process. So. I think these health freedom laws are perfect. Um, 
there are these 10 states that now have these health freedom laws. Uh, seven of these states have added the, their health freedom laws within the past 15 years, uh, starting with California back in 2001. Uh, so the first um, 10 plus years of my homeopathic practice, I practiced without any law protecting the practice of homeopathy, but we now have that in California as well as in these other nine states. And if you want to know more about that, uh, the National Health Freedom Coalition is working to get these laws passed in all 50 states. And I remember when California got passed, they were saying, you know, as as goes California, so goes the rest of the country. So the hope is that the momentum being gathered by um, by passing laws in these other states is going to really help uh, the rest of the states to get on board with these laws that are very practical, um, both for the practitioners and for the people who seek natural health care. Another interesting thing that uh, came up is uh, a Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Luke Montagnier, who's a French virologist, and he won the Nobel, Nobel Prize in 2008 for discovering the AIDS virus. And he's very strong supporter of homeopathic medicine. This is a direct quote from him. He said, I can't say that homeopathy is right in everything. What I can say now is that the high dilutions used in homeopathy are right. High dilutions of something are not nothing. They are, water, there are, they are water structures which mimic the original molecules. So, you know, one of the issues with homeopathy with um, allopaths or mainstream doctors who even have any sense or notion of the principles is that it doesn't fit in with regular physical principles in terms of the whole idea of potentization. But there are scientists um, such as uh, this esteemed Nobel Prize winner who are saying, yes, water does have a memory. Water does um, pick up something and that, that uh, can have a very powerful influence um, on physiology. So, um, the, so this, seg this third point here, although it's common for modern day, modern day scientists to assume that none of the original molecules remain in solution, Montagnier's research and others of many of his colleagues has verified that electromagnetic signals of the original medicine remains in the water and has dramatic biological effects. And yeah, so this is basically the principle of homeopathy is that it's an energy medicine, but it's an energy medicine that's prepared by actual, from actual substances. Uh, but then through the process of uh, dynamization or potentization, uh, we end up with just the energy of the medicine, which is why we can uh, make homeopathic remedies from things like mercury, uh, which is a poison if you took it in the physical dose. Another recent thing that just happened in the next uh, last week or so is uh, another European country of which there are many, I think France and Germany are also in this boat. Um, is that homeopathy has the same status as conventional medicine now in Switzerland. Uh, so the Interior Ministry announced that it was going to give five complementary therapies, including homeopathy, the same status as conventional medicine, uh, meaning that basically the state's going to pay for homeopathic treatment. Uh, now in some countries in Europe, uh, homeopath, homeopathy is practiced more by medical doctors, um, but for example, in the UK, most of the homeopaths are uh, what we call professional homeopaths, non-medical homeopaths, which is what I am. Um, we do have uh, people who go through the Caduceus program who are medical doctors, nurses, all kinds of um, medical professionals do go through our program, but a majority of our students are moving into homeopathy as a second career and not necessarily uh, because they had a not necessarily with a medical background in the past and actually if you have a medical background in your past it's actually something you have to unlearn a little bit uh, some of the most challenging students i've had have been medical doctors uh, not challenging in terms of their personality but because their their view of medicine was so um, formed already according to the allopathic approach, which is the opposite of homeopathy. Homeopathy is very individualized, is very much about 
identifying what's unique and special about a person and what their symptoms are that are different from everybody else. Whereas allopaths want to do the opposite thing. They want to figure out what huge group you belong to so you, they can give you, you know, a medicine that that huge group um, is, you know, identifies as or the medicine for that huge group. So it's, yeah, it's challenging to overcome a medical education in some ways because you've been trained, you know, to think about diseases instead of people, you know, and so to learn how to think holistically can be a challenge. Uh, nurses have an easier idea, uh, an easier time because uh, nursing is, a mo is more holistic and nurses are taught to think more about the whole person. So um, two thirds of the Swiss people um, backed their inclusion on the constitutional list of paid health services. So they, they booted it in 2005 because they didn't think there was enough scientific proof for it. And again, a homeopathy um, is actually easier to prove uh, in a couple of ways. One, through these kind of scientific approaches, such as what I, uh, the work that I shared with you just now, and the other is through epidemics, uh, where you have mass groups of people uh, who are responding to remedies. But in terms of other kinds of studies, the way that allopathic medical studies are designed, they don't really suit homeopathy because homeopathy is so individualized. So, you know, with allopathic drugs, you would develop a drug, let's say high blood pressure, and you'd want to give it to 100,000 people and see if it got their high blood pressure better. But with homeopathy, if you had 100,000 people with high blood pressure, there would be hundreds of different remedies they might need. So you couldn't just test one remedy against it. So the whole model of uh, medical research is really based on um, allopathic drugs and so there are other ways really to see how well homeopathy works that are better than um, regular allopathic drug studies. Now I'm going to change continents and talk a little bit about uh, other places such as Africa. Um, Jeremy Scher, who's a wonderful homeopath, one of my uh, teachers, I went through his graduate program, uh, moved several years ago to Africa because he really wanted to work with AIDS and really wanted to bring homeopathy to a place that needed it. And because homeopathy has done so well, as I've said, in India, in Cuba, in Brazil, in these kind of tropical countries, he really felt that uh, Africa should really have homeopathy as well. And another uh, colleague of mine and teacher of mine, Richard Pitt, is also um, doing uh, starting schools and clinics in Africa. I'm highlighting Jeremy's work just because I have some nice pictures from him, but there are other people who are doing this as well. So they opened up a free clinic, a free permanent clinic in 2013. They're working with AIDS patients and they're offering integrated care, um, including homeopathy, osteopathy, nutritional advice, et cetera. Micro, even microfinance. So they're helping people uh, develop their own small businesses uh, to be able to support themselves. Uh, they have been training uh, homeopaths in Tanz Tanzania and also Kenya. And they're running courses all over East Africa. And here's um, one of their students who's teaching homeopathy now. And they have a course that's operating in 12 countries. And here is um, a homeopath from New Zealand who has come to Africa and is treating cows, goats, horses, and chickens at the local farms and training the farmers how to use homeopathy as well. Milk yields are rising, parasites are few, and seriously malnourished animals are gaining weight. He says, we plan to help chimp chimpanzees next. So um, this is kind of going back to, as we saw, Prince Charles is also treating his animals with homeopathy. Uh, sometimes one of the arguments against homeopathy is, oh, it's all just placebo. But when you see it work for animals, then you know it's not just placebo. Now, India, homeopathy in India. Now, this is a really interesting um, place for homeopathy because as I said earlier, homeopathy is, is almost completely mainstream in India. 
Um, I'll give you some statistics in a little while about the, the, the amount of, of homeopathic schools, the amount of homeopaths is just astounding. So the way that it came to India was very early on. Um, a French traveler who had learned homeopathy from Dr. Samuel Hahnemann visited India and treated some patients with homeopathy. On his second visit in the year 1839, he successfully treated the ruler of Punjab, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, who had paralysis of his vocal cords and, and some edema, some swelling. And the Maharaja was so happy with the results that he encouraged him to continue the homeo homeopathic treatment in India and homeopathy just continued to spread and Indians found its philosophy and principles to be very much attuned with their beliefs and culture. So homeopathy has just has been popular and highly used um, and very well established in India uh, for 200 years. Mother Teresa used homeopathy as well um, in her mission. There are over 246,000 homeopathic doctors in India and over 7,000 homeopathic hospitals and dispensaries in India. If you can even imagine how huge homeopathy is. Literally, there's a homeopath on every block. Um, I've been there and it's fantastic. Uh, and uh, so there are uh, Mother Teresa was using homeopathy. She established four homeopathic, charitable homeopathic dispensaries um, in, for, uh, so it was definitely part of her mission. And she really felt that, uh, you know, it was an effective treatment and a primary method of treatment and not expensive. So working with the poor, it really, really helped. And as you may know, Mahatma Gandhi, um, the founder of uh, the modern country of India, was also a great proponent of homeopathy. He, this is a quote from him, homeopathy cures a greater percentage of cases than any other method of treatment. Homeopathy is the latest and refined method of treating patients economically and nonviolently. So you can see how um, popular homeopathy is and was in India and how well appreciated and how effective it's considered to be in India. Um, this is me in India. Uh, I, I have gone to India several times and some of the times I've gone, I did also a free clinic in a remote part of India that where people did not have any access to medical care. So I was giving homeopathic remedies and vitamins and advice and uh, everything that I could do. Um, so yeah, I love India and it's uh, a wonderful place for home for to learn and to practice homeopathy. Here's another fairly recent uh, information that um, the Har a Harvard study has good news for homeopathic medicine. A team at Harvard School, Harvard's School of Public Health notes that prior studies of homeopathy suggest potential public health benefits, such as reductions in unnecessary antibiotic usage, which goes right back to the first information we were looking at about um, how well it does in epidemics. Reductions in costs to treat certain respiratory diseases, improvements in perimenopausal depression. Um, that's something I've treated a lot in my practice and homeopathy is just incredible for that and for helping women um, either get off hormone replacement therapy or not need it um, or, and increase uh, and uh, improve mood, etc. Improved health outcomes in chronically ill individuals and a control of leptospirosis epidemic in Cuba. That was a, a famous study that happened fairly recently where there was an epidemic in Cuba that I had mentioned a little earlier. And, uh, and so Harvard School of Public Health looked at this and said, oh yes, this is true. Uh, homeopathy seems to be helping in these ways. So um, homeopathy is now being used by about 15% of the population 
um, or it's jumped 15% in use, but it's still only used by a few people. A lot of people just don't know about homeopathy. And in fact, becoming a homeopath in the United States be, means really becoming an educator in a certain way, educating your friends, your community, your churches, your schools, um, to tell them about homeopathy because uh, the information has been lost. Uh, so uh, most users put homeopathy among the ten top three complementary and integrative strategies they use in their healthcare. Now, another thing that they came up with is that um, positive views of homeopathy were much higher among those who saw a professional homeopath compared to those who simply purchased the pills from the store and self-prescribed. Those who consulted professionals were more likely to feel that homeopathy was very important to maintaining their health and well-being. So this is where you come in. Um, is that we need homeopaths uh, because homeopathy works better when the remedies are chosen by well-educated homeopaths. And this is where um, I want to uh, share some really inspiring uh, uh, videos with you. So I'm going to stop sharing over here for a minute and we're going to go back to this. And then I'm going to share again um, and we are going to go again to, hold on a second, um, we are going to go to this screen here. And what I, what this is, this is a website in the UK, which has, it's put on by, it's called the Homeopathy uh, Course Providers Forum. And what they did is they recently posted a number of interviews with um, homeopaths from uh, their schools um, explaining about their practices. So I was, I'm going to play a few of these for you. You can also go to our school website, homeopathytraining.org. We don't have videos up, but we do have um, little testimonials or blurbs by some of our graduates explaining what they've done with their education but I'm gonna go ahead and play this for you now. And I hope you can hear it. This is. My name's Hilary Dorian and I'm a homeopath. I started my career in homeopathy actually as an acupuncturist uh, nearly 35 years ago and after qualifying as an acupuncturist I realised that there was perhaps a gap in my practice. So I studied homeopathy and once I started practising that was it. I fell in love with homeopathy and now my practice is 95% uh, homeopathy. Homeopathy is 200 years old. It's kind, gentle, safe and effective as a form of medicine and it's used by maybe millions of people throughout the world as their primary health care and I think that speaks for itself. I think people should train in homeopathy because it's a fascinating and interesting subject. It's a brilliant career choice because it's somewhere you can help people. I have recently seen a little girl with very very severe eczema who after two months on homeopathic remedies is hugely better. It's a real journey becoming a practitioner and a very very rewarding one. You're constantly learning and you're helping to make a difference in the world and you're earning money and being self-employed is also something which I think is fantastic. I studied and practiced homeopathy when I had young children I could actually fit my practice around my children because I'm self-employed and I could work the days and times that I wanted to work. The homeopaths can practice in many different ways and locations to suit their needs. Lots of homeopaths practice from their own home, for instance. Some do home visits working in the patient's own home, uh, some work in multidisciplinary practices with homeopaths and with osteopaths. Uh, in other words, it's very flexible. Making a living out of homeopathy is a very real option. Once you've graduated as a homeopath, you're going to be a self-employed person. And like any other self-employed person, you're going to have to work hard to get the energy back. But once you've got some patients coming in and getting better, they're going to become quite evangelistic about homeopathy. They're going to tell other people. And before you know it, you're going to have a really thriving practice. Okay, 
there's one. Now we're going to go to another one. Here is Max. My name is Max Mainini. I started to be a hotel manager in my teens. And in my mid-30s, I wanted to make a career change. And I was looking to find something that would actually make a real difference in people's lives. Natural medicine has always interested me. I've been fascinated by it from when I was a small child. And homeopathy was a perfect fit for me. If someone's thinking about becoming a homeopath, they need to find a good college to start with. I chose a college that was uh, very close to me, but actually had a very, very good reputation, and that was the College of Practical Homeopathy. We learnt, obviously, all the homeopathic philosophy, but we learnt anatomy and physiology as well. The thing that stood out clearly for me during the training process was how homeopathy embraces that holistic approach. So you get to understand the person you are treating, why they're experiencing what they're experiencing and treat it from that individual perspective. I love that. And that's what you learn from the very beginning. I remember when I first qualified, one of the people that came in for treatment was suffering from chronic insomnia, fatigue, chronic headaches. And because of the approach of homeopathy, I managed to find out that these symptoms all started when that person's mother had died. And they hadn't come to terms with the grief. And these symptoms were absolutely related to that. And so once I started treatment, they all disappeared within a few weeks. And it gave me great confidence, especially in the early stages, to know what a difference I could make with such a wonderful system of medicine. There are different approaches to making a living as a homeopath. One of them is to do it part-time. The other thing that is a choice is obviously to become a full-time homeopath like me. Homeopathy is growing all the time. I mean, my practice is full. People come through referrals, so when people get better, they speak to their friends and their friends come along because they actually trust what their friends have told them. And when they find the results that work for them, then they will start to think of homeopathy always as a first choice. Homeopathy has many advantages. One of the great benefits for me is that whenever I am ill or members of my family are ill, we have homeopathy as a first point of call. And that's what I like. Okay, and we're going to watch one more of these. We're going to go down to Uli. My name is Uli. I am a homeopath. I did my training here in England and I practice from home. I discovered homeopathy when I was working as an intensive care nurse in a homeopathic hospital in Germany. When I saw how effective homeopathy is, I decided to become a homeopath myself. I started treating a lady who suffered a heart attack. We started homeopathic treatment three or four weeks after she suffered the attack. The initial scan showed two scars. The main remedy which really made a difference was Crotigus. She was taking it for about half a year. Then she had an MRI scan and the MRI scan didn't show any scar of her heart. For me, working as a homeopath is the perfect career. I can book my own appointments. I'm flexible in terms of working hours. It works very well around my family. It's making a big difference in someone's life. It's just wonderful. My favorite thing about being a homeopath is truly to help other people. So you don't treat just an organ system or a disease, you treat the person. So when a patient comes to see me, I look at everything, I take everything into account, not just their physical symptoms, and the homeopathic remedy that is then selected basically covers everything. Alongside my practice as a homeopath, I lecture at a local homeopathic college and I always look forward to seeing the students there to help them to become competent homeopaths. It's a truly exciting and growing industry. For me, it's very realistic to make a living as a homeopath. Anyone who wants to study homeopathy and they think, mm, I can't make a living out of this, now you can make a living out of it. Oh, 
All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. So I just wanted to go back and talk a little bit about education. So really, what's it like to be a homeopath? Uh, we've now seen some interviews with some homeopaths and it's really up to people getting the education and going out there and practicing homeopathy. So I hope you found uh, those inspiring. I wanted just to tell you a little bit about our institute. Um, it's a self-paced distance learning program. You can start at any time and go at your own pace. We base our program on Hahnemann's Organon, which is the basic textbook of homeopathy. And we also teach very much uh, the practice of homeopathy. We're very focused on the actual practical aspects of homeopathy. We also have a really supportive online community. Um, we have um, students all over the country and all over the world sharing experiences, sharing cases, uh, sharing information. Um, once a month, we go online and have a monthly online meeting and talk. And you can also visit our graduate page um, at homeopathytraining.org. You can go to the graduate page and you can see what some of the graduates are doing from our program. So that's uh, a little bit about homeopathy and um, I hope that you can investigate a little bit more about it. If you're considering be, uh, becoming a homeopath, feel free to contact our program. If you have any questions, we'd love to talk to you.